Living Word is brought to you by International Central Gospel Church. Celebrating 25 years of raising leaders, shaping vision, and influencing society through Christ. Today's message. I'm speaking on faithfulness. Faithfulness. It is one of those important ingredients that are required for us to be accepted before God. As a matter of fact, when we stand before God, His commendation to us, if He approves of us, will be that we are good and faithful servants. So, God is looking for faithfulness. He's requiring faithfulness from us. And for everything we do here on earth, for it to really become successful, for it to merit God's approval, there has to be a spirit of faithfulness that backs it and that works with it. So we're going to look a little bit into that subject today as we prepare our hearts to honor God with our lives. What does it mean to be faithful? There are four other words that also uh, help us to understand what it means to be faithful. To be faithful means to be devoted. That simply means to be totally committed to something. To be wholly committed to something. To be devoted. To be faithful also is to be honest. To stick with the truth. To be sincere and not to be dubious and devious. To be faithful is to be trustworthy. And to be faithful is to be dependable. When we say that somebody is faithful, these qualities must be found in that person. First of all, God himself is faithful. And God is devoted to us. He is devoted to his cause. God is honest. His word is true. He is trustworthy. He is dependable. But not only is God faithful, He requires the same from us. He requires that we also become faithful. So turn with me in our opening text to Luke's Gospel chapter 16. Luke's Gospel chapter 16 and I'm going to read from verse 10 to verse number 12. This is the conclusion or the summary that Jesus gave concerning he, the, the actions of a man whose story that Jesus had told in a parable. A steward who knew that he was going to lose his job and, uh, and acted shrewdly to protect his future. And so Jesus makes a commentary on his work, on his attitude. And this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 16 verse 10 to 12. He says, He who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own. Jesus talks about faithfulness. And he talks about three areas of faithfulness that I believe are still relevant. God requires from us three areas of faithfulness the first one is faithfulness with little things or faithfulness in that which is least faithfulness with little things this is the first measure of faithfulness it is the first test 
of faithfulness. If God wants to test to see whether we are faithful, He is going to see our attitude or He's going to judge our attitude to little things, not to the big things, not to wait until things have become great, but how you handle little things. That's the first test. And if you don't pass that test, He's not going to take you any further. The second test of faithfulness is faithfulness with money. When you pass the test of little things, God is going to give you money. In the parable, he calls it unrighteous mammon. Money. How we deal with money will determine what God does with us next. He says, if you've been unfaithful with unrighteous mammon, who is going to commit to you true riches. True riches. God cannot give to you his true riches, true heritage, true inheritance, until you have passed the money test. Third area of faithfulness is faithfulness with other people's properties. Faithfulness with other people's properties. So, if God wants to judge whether we are faithful or not, and we can actually do a self-examination of whether we are faithful or not before we stand before in the Lord in judgment, we have to test our hearts whether we are faithful. Otherwise, you would stand before him and wish he would say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and probably what you hear would not be what you would be enthused about. So before that time comes, we have to do self-examination. Are we faithful in little things? Are we faithful with money? And are we faithful with other people's properties? Are we dependable? Can we be trusted with money? Can we be trusted with other people's pro property? When people trust us with their work, are we dependable? Are we devoted? When we are trusted with money or when we are given money, do we act in an honest manner? Faithfulness in these three areas are critical for us to meet God's approval. So what I'm going to do is to do three case studies of three people in the Bible. And I'm going to use the example in reference to all the three areas I mentioned. Faith, faithfulness in little things, faithfulness with money, faithfulness with other people's property. So the first case study, the first example, is the example of David. And David teaches us about faithfulness with little things. Faithfulness with little things. We know David as a great king, as a great psalmist, a man who did powerful things. And I suppose that for most of us, when we hear the name of David, the first thing we think about is Goliath. His name is paired with Goliath, David and Goliath. And uh, we use the analogy of David and Goliath in every situation, whether it's the satellites playing Brazil or, or some underdog fighting somebody who is bigger. Uh, we, we, we see the underdog as David and Goliath as the, as the top dog, as the big person. But before David dealt with Goliath, he had to deal with little things. He had to be faithful in little things. If you are not faithful in little things, you will never have your Goliath. And David had to deal with little things. Let's look at how uh, he dealt with the little things. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 28 and 29. 1 Samuel 17, 28 to 29. Uh, this is when David had gone to the battlefront where um, the armies of Israel were encamped against the armies of the Philistines and there was a stalemate in the battle because this big guy called Goliath is threatening the armies of Israel and had issued uh, a statement uh, of war against Israel. And Israel had no response to that a threat that was coming from, uh, from Goliath. 
the whole army was in disarray. And David goes out there and, and sees what is going on. And somehow he feels he must do something about it. But before he can do something about it, his brother, his oldest brother, Eliab, who was a military man, uh, makes this statement about David. And I think I want you to uh, focus on something very unique about the statement. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke with the men, or to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I want you to note that phrase. Those few sheep in the wilderness. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? But what I want to focus on is those few sheep. We know David as a shepherd. How many sheep was he watching? According to Eliab, few sheep. So he wasn't a big time shepherd. As a matter of fact, he was the last born of his family. And he was the only one who was keeping the family sheep. If there were a lot of sheep, there would be probably about three or four brothers watching the sheep. If it is him alone, it was a few sheep, according to Eliab. And it stands to reason that the family of David was a poor family, just had a few sheep, and David was the one who was watching over them. And we know the story of David, that he protected those sheep with his life. That he, he fought for the sheep, he, he, he worked so hard that not even one would be lost because they were just a few sheep. Faithfulness in little things. Now, the question that Eliab asked, how did David respond to it? What had David done with those few sheep? Faithfulness, was he faithful with the few sheep? Now go back to verse 17. Of chapter 17 of 1st Samuel verse 17 and we'll see David's attitude to the few sheep then Jesse said to his son David take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Verse 20, note carefully what David did with the few sheep. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to the camp as the army was going out to the battle and shouting for the battle David left the sheep with a keeper he rose early in the morning and he left the sheep with a keeper he didn't just zoom off because the sheep are too small faithfulness in little things no wonder God gave him a big sheep called Goliath to deal with. If you have not been faithful in little things, who will commit to you the big things? God wants to do great things in our lives, but he's going to watch for the way we handle the little things. So how do we handle the little things? First, recognize and appreciate your small beginnings everybody is going to begin small with a few sheep everybody is going to start small except maybe you are the son of the queen of england then you start big but for us normal people we start small everybody whether you start in a business you start in a marriage you start in a life, whatever you're starting, you start in a church, you're going to start small with few resources, few people. 
And many times our heart is so full of the big vision that we despise the small things God has taken us through. When God starts with you, never disrespect, never despise your small beginnings. David was anointed. He knew he was going to be king. At this time he knew it, definitely. He knew that he was going to rule over Israel. Samuel had come. Samuel had anointed him. And now he's given the chance to go out to see the battle. And the Bible says he rose early in the morning. But he was a man of detail. He got somebody and committed the few sheep into that person's hands. Is that how we handle our lives? Or when... We have a big dream. We abandon the small things of our lives. The second thing we note about David, the Bible says he rose early in the morning. He was enthusiastic about the assignment. You have to be enthusiastic about the responsibilities assigned to you. The beginning of things can be very boring and annoying. You start... It can be very, very aggravating. I remember when I started uh, this church. It was a small church. And there were certain other churches which were more established than us. And most of the time, uh, I would either drive past those churches on a Sunday morning when I'm coming to my church. And you see cars parked on the car park of those churches lots of people nice cars people well dressed women well dressed men well dressed married couples with their children well dressed everybody well dressed then i come to my church empty car park i look at the people hungry and depressed and angry with life people who haven't achieved much they weren't nicely dressed. As a matter of fact, where we met, if you were nicely dressed, it would be a disincentive to your clothes. So people came as they were. You didn't see older families coming with children, nicely dressed, no cars, but they were my sheep. They were the sheep. And if I was going to be given greater responsibility by God, I had to be enthusiastic about that sheep. When I had preached, I had to preach with enthusiasm. I had to preach with my heart. I had to preach as if I was preaching to the best group in the world. Although what stood in front of me didn't look like the best group. If you despise the little things, nobody will give you great opportunity. I made a commitment to God that when I stand before the people to preach... I would never stand unprepared. I never went to church without knowing what I was supposed to preach. Still never do that. Always know what I'm going to say. Prepare into detail what I'm going to say. Because you don't take the little sheep for granted. If you despise, you downgrade, and you reduce the little responsibilities you have, nobody is going to give you the big responsibilities. For some of you, the little responsibility may be cleaning somebody's house. It may be a little responsibility you have in the church. It may be a little responsibility you have in the office or at home. Maybe all you have to do when you get up is to dress your bed or dress somebody's bed. That's your responsibility. Dress it with enthusiasm. Never go to your job angry complaining and sulking never go to the office criticizing the office go into your office with enthusiasm and the little opportunities you have take them and never compare them with the big opportunities and downgrade your own opportunity because god will test you with small things he'll test you you start life as a married couple You'll be tested. You're going to have small things. 
Poverty is part of life. Especially early marriage. Where you can't meet any expenditure. Nothing is working. Your roof is leaking. The water is not flowing. Electricity is not reliable. The fridge is breaking down. The TV has headache. And, and, and your, and your um, furniture have arthritis. <laughs> Nothing seems to work. But you go to other people's house and everything is working. Don't despise your small beginnings. Don't despise your small beginnings. Don't love somebody's home more than your home. Don't love somebody's husband more than your husband. That's what you bargain for and that's what you got. Don't look for an already made person. Grow what you have. You start with a small sheep. David, that's all he had. He didn't have an army. He had small sheep. But that was his army. And when he had to do this errand, he took good care of them. He had an eye for the small things. Thirdly, to be faithful in little things, this is one lesson you must learn. Whilst moving on to bigger things, keep your eyes on the small things. Many times people get promised of, with great things. And all of a sudden, they have no respect for the little things. David could actually have said, now I know I'm going to be king. Samuel has anointed me. I'm going to the battle. I'm fed up with this sheep and leave the sheep unattended. If they die, they die. After all, I'm going to be king. What would you do if you had a promise? If you have, you know, sometimes I, I see married couples who have a great offer, maybe to go to America, and they leave their children in the hands of an irresponsible relative. The children are suffering. They have no clothes. There are flies all over their face. But they are going out there seeking the big things, but the small things have been abandoned. And how can God give you great things when you don't take care of the sheep and put them in the hands of a good keeper? And here it's not even sheep, it's human beings. How can couples leave their children for 10 years? 12 years looking for money in America or Germany or London. And you say, well, one day when I make money, I will solve the problem. Who tells you money solves problems? There are many things money cannot buy. It cannot buy good training. It cannot buy confidence. It cannot buy love. It cannot buy affection. You may get all the money, but your children will always feel they are second class. They are second class to your money, to your dreams, to your vision. If you are not faithful in little things, how can God give you big things? No wonder those people go there and hustle and clean and clean white people and clean toilets and clean for four different jobs and never make any money because they have abandoned the first rule of faithfulness, faithfulness in little things. Yes, God has called you to great things. But be careful that the sheep will be left in good hands. And it's not only in children, it's in every area of our lives. Don't be too, too enthusiastic about big vision, big dreams, big ideas that you forget about the little things that God has committed to you. Because he's not judging you by the big things, he's judging you by the little things. Faithfulness in little things. And no wonder David left that place, went out to the battle, and faced Goliath and won. Because he had been faithful in little things. God said, if this man, even for this few sheep, 
can make these detailed preparations for the sheep, I can trust him with a nation. Can God trust you? Are you trustworthy? What are the little things you don't care about any longer? Because you become big. Because your vision is big. Because now God is doing big things with you. Your little wife is left behind. Your little husband is left behind. Your little children are left behind. Your little friends are left behind. Now you're doing, having friends with big shots. Faithfulness in little things. Second area of faithfulness, second case study. Abraham teaches us about faithfulness with money. Money is powerful. How many of you know that? Money breeds. It is said that money is blood. But money is a powerful master and a powerful controller. You'd be amazed what people would do for it. There's a particular rich man in this country. I don't know whether he was rich or he said he was rich and we believe he was rich, but people thought he was rich. And uh, in his home, he used to invite people to come and dance for money. And people would go, parents, adults, would go to dance for money. And he would start distributing the money and saying, this one is dancing well, that one is dancing well. And as people saw the money is moving and they're not getting the money, they dance with more frenzy, with more energy, and, and, and people just went into all kinds of gyrations simply to attract the eyes of a man to give them money. It's amazing what people can do. The kinds of dance moves that showed up in that man's house. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. To correspond with Dr. Mensah Otterville, please write to Living Word, International Central Gospel Church, P.O. Box 7933, Accra, Ghana. Call 021-688-000. Fax 021-688-007. Email otterville at centralgospel.com and visit our website at www.centralgospel.com. Living Word is brought to you by International Central Gospel Church. Celebrating 25 years of raising leaders, shaping vision, and influencing society through Christ. Welcome, my friends, once again to The Living Word. I'm Pastor Mensah Otabel. It's a joy and a privilege to have this encounter with you. I know we're getting close to the end of the year. Uh, Christmas is coming, the new year is coming, and you're getting yourself busy. But I trust that as you get yourself busy, that you also consider some of the things that I want to share with you today. I'm concluding my message on faithfulness. Faithfulness in little things. We've looked at David in faithfulness. We're going to look at Abraham and Joseph. These are prominent people in the Bible who achieve greatness. And sometimes we admire them, we want to be like them, and we desire that God uses them us the way he used them. But we also discover that there are aspects of their life that probably we haven't taken a close look at. And their faithfulness in the service that was given to them led them to the greatness that they achieved in their lives. So today as we look at these stories, I pray that you will apply your heart to wisdom. And now, today's message. Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 to 24. 
This is after Abraham had won a great battle. And those days when you won a battle, you also took home what is called the booty. And when Abraham was returning from the battle, the Bible says, Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourselves. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, Anna, Esco, and Mamre, and let them take their portion. Abraham had fought the battle with 318 or so men from his family, slaves or house, house not slaves, house, house helps, and had won this battle. The battle, the victory belonged to him. He fought, he won, and uh, everything he got belonged to him. But when he was coming out, he saw... Melchizedek, the priest of God, holding bread and wine, representing the communion. And come came into covenant with him and served him with communion. And afterwards, Melchizedek did not ask for anything, but Abraham took a tenth of everything he had made and gave it to Melchizedek. If you're going to be faithful with money, the first thing you have to do is to consider yourself a steward and your money as God's resources. A steward is a caretaker. Somebody who has been entrusted with something. And your money must not just be seen as yours, but it is God's resources. I know you work for your money, thank God. I know you work very hard. I know you get up probably at 4 o'clock in the morning, get to the office, work very hard and sweat and make your money. But what if you didn't get up? What if in the morning you wanted to get up, your brain said you should get up, but your waist didn't want to get up? Or your hand didn't want to move? Or your tongue had stuck to the roof of your mouth? What if you went to the office and you lost the memory of everything you've learned? So you work hard. But there are so many aspects of your wealth you didn't control. That's God's part. And so, although you work hard, which is commendable, without Him giving you life in the first place, you have nothing to boast of. So this is the attitude we should have. I am a steward. That means that whatever comes into my hand, although I fought for it, like Abraham fought for it, Primarily, it belongs to God. And whatever I have, although it's in my name, it's God's resources. When we have that mentality, then we can have a good attitude towards our money. Otherwise, when money comes into your hand, you will go crazy. You think you got it by yourself? You think it's because of your smartness? Yes, to a large extent, because you are smart, you are inventive, you are creative, you started a business, it's working, you pay the price, you sweat it, and you've gained the money. And that's true. For Abraham, he went to battle, he put his own life on the line, he could have been killed. That's true. And then a man shows up, he didn't know, Melchizedek, priest of God, and Abraham gives him the tithe of all. Why did Abraham do that? Melchizedek didn't fight. Abraham remembered that everything he had, his life and his property, belonged to God. 
consider yourself a steward and your money as God's resources. Secondly, determine to faithfully honor God with your tithes and offerings. I don't know why we should even teach on this again because I think when it comes to tithes and offerings, we should be so faithful we don't even need to go back and talk about it again. And it's not because we are preachers, that's why we teach tithes and offerings is the Bible. I must honor God with my tithes just like everybody else. I must be faithful. When God gives me a victory, I must give him his portion. I must acknowledge that whatever I have belongs to God. My strength belongs to him. My sweat belongs to him. My brains belong to him. My ideas belong to him. Whatever I have belongs to him. And so he says, set apart a portion that belongs to God. You know, when it comes to uh, paying our taxes, which most of the time is more than 10%, they deduct it even at source. <laughs> pay ye. It's called pay ye. Pay as you earn. As you are earning, it's going. And depending on which salary bracket you are in, it could be more than one third of your earnings. It's gone. Nobody complains. God says, well, you've given to Caesar what is Caesar's. Your taxes. Now give to God what is God's. That one too has become a quarrel. And then we fight. And then people are, ah, you know, this, 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 this month is hard. Now, can you ever say to the government, this month is hard, so I won't pay tax? No. You give without thinking twice. The same way, I don't consider my tithe as part of my salary. When I think of my salary, I don't calculate tithe into it. It's not, it's not in the equation. That is God's portion. God's portion is not your portion. It's not even yours to take out to give to God. It's God's from the beginning and you don't rob him from it. If you want God to bless you and give you true riches, he says he's going to test you with money. Have you passed the money test? Or you have stolen God's money? People will say, ah, but uh, I don't know what the money is used for. Well, I'm not sure where, whether Abraham knew where his, uh, Melchizedek came from and where he was going. But he gave because Abraham said, this, it doesn't belong to me anyway. It's God's portion and I give it to God. And it is after Abraham started this process that the blessing started following him. You read later on that Abraham became exceedingly rich. His children had the same blessing. When Jacob was in trouble, it was when he made the vow of the tithe that things started changing for him. Because if you give God his portion, he will give you his portion. If you give him a tenth, he doesn't give you a tenth. He gives you good measure, present and shaking together and running over. God doesn't give you equal what you give him. He gives you far more than you give to him. Giving the tithe is not something you do once in a while when the pastor preaches about it. It's a covenant. I think as far as I can remember, since I was about probably about 18 or 19, I've tithe faithfully I don't need anybody to preach that to me and I didn't start because I was a pastor but I realized this is God's principle what I have belongs to him I work hard yes but it all belongs to him and when he gives the increase I must make a declaration to myself and to heaven that I recognize God as the source of my life be a faithful tither if God cannot trust you in your tithe and you cannot be faithful in your tithe God will not give you his true riches the way to really enjoy life with no sorrows added is to be faithful to God and he'll be faithful to you faithfulness with money third 
don't grab greedily for quick monetary rewards. When Abraham had his breakthrough, he had the money, he gave the tithe to Melchizedek. Then the king of Sodom, another king came and says, Hey Abraham, listen, keep all the money, all the things you got from this battle, keep it. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we, we recognize you fought very hard because you defended all of us, keep the money. And Abraham said something that is interesting. He said, I have made a vow to God that I'm not going to take anything that does not belong to me so that somebody will one day say they made Abraham rich. So he has given the tenth to Melchizedek. Now he's left, if we say, with a 90%. Legally, it is his. But he also knew, knows that the thing he collected from the battle, they belonged to the kings that the enemy had already dispossessed. So he actually went to fight to restore property to those people. So he said, well, I fought and I risked my life, but I have given the tenth to God, but the rest of it I know originally it belonged to you, king of Sodom, so take yours. The only thing I ask for is that those people who worked for me and fought for me, pay them their wages. As for me, leave me alone because I don't want you one day to say, you made me rich. Abraham knew he would be rich and he didn't want the king of Sodom to get the credit. If you know anything about the king of Sodom, he was a king of Sodom, which later was the Sodom and Gomorrah we know. So he wasn't really a righteous person. And Abraham didn't want an unrighteous king to one day claim that they made him prosperous. So he said, it's yours. I redeemed it for you. Take it. That shows you a man who is not greedy for money. But it also shows you a man who is concerned for his workers. He says, pay my workers, give them what is theirs, and take the rest. So the 10% goes to Melchizedek. The bulk of it goes back to the people whose property he had redeemed. And the rest goes to service his company to pay the wages and salaries of his staff. And Abraham goes on with his life just to believe God. I think he gives us a model of how to handle money. God is able to take care of you. Third area of faithfulness is faithfulness in other people's property. The best example is Joseph. We know Joseph and all that he did, a great dreamer who got into trouble with his brother, sold into slavery, later rescued from prison, inter interprets dreams, overnight becomes prime minister. Phenomenal story. But before he got there, listen to how The Bible describes his sense of responsibility. Genesis chapter 39, verse 8 to 9. As you know, when uh, he got into the house of Potiphar, he was given oversight over the house of Potiphar. And then over time, the, 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 the Potiphar's wife started making moves on him. There's a whole lesson to learn from there. There are some men who can't stand that. Uh, one woman comes and says, oh, you, oh, I like your tie. And all of a sudden, your brain just goes haywire. All the screws are unplugged. You be... All right. But he refused. So let's listen to what happens. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is not one greater in this house than I. Remember, he started as a slave. Look at now his position. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Faithfulness with other people's properties, including their wives. How do you do that? First, when... You see other people's properties, you have to regard them as your own. Not their wives as your own, but their <laughs> other properties. 
I think one of the bad uh, habits we have developed, especially in this nation, is we don't care for things that don't belong to us. Maybe it came through the colonial rule when we were ruled by foreigners and we saw their, what they had as not belonging to us. And, and so right from there, government money, government uh, property was abused. And we've taken it almost to every area. And uh, as, as a matter of fact, when you take good care of other people's property, people insult you. And the question they ask is, is it for your father? It's not yours. Why are you taking good care of it? You take good care of company property. People get angry with you. You take good care of government property. People get upset. You take good care of church property. People get upset. You take good care of anything that is not yours. People think you're not correct upstairs. But the Bible says if you're not faithful in another man's, how can God give you your own? In other words, one of the reasons why God will give you something that is yours is because you were a good taker of something that did not belong to you. And that something may be government property, government time, government telephone, company telephone, company time. If you spend, use company telephone to make private calls, oh, <laughs> and just laughing on company time. You are not faithful in another man's property. And who will give you your own? One of these days, you're going to be your own owner of a company, and your workers are also going to use your phone to make such, such calls. Then you will start feeling what it is like. But don't wait till that time. Be faithful in another man's, and God will give you your own. Regard other people's properties as your own. Be a trusted burden bearer for those who depend on you for support. One of the things I like about Joseph, that he said the master Potiphar doesn't even worry about how his household will be taken care of. Once Joseph was in charge he took his mind off totally because Joseph was totally dependable. He was a burden bearer. He was required to do a job. He did it so well, his master didn't bother. Does your boss bother about your job? Are you a good burden bearer? When you're given a job, do you need frequent supervision? Do you need your boss to come and give you the same instructions he's been giving for the last 10 years? Do it this way, do it that way, do it, do it, take it from here. Ah, why? Can't you learn the lesson? Is that how people comment on your work? If that is how they comment on your work, you're not faithful. You're not faithful. Joseph was very faithful. The master didn't have to come and give two instructions. He didn't even have to worry when Joseph held that responsibility. A burden bearer is one who holds a load and is able to hold it. It's like the pillars of this building. They don't, they don't get tired. I don't come every Monday or Sunday and, and hit the pillars of the church or the tour and hit them. Hey, are they well? Charlie, security, uh, stand by the pillars. You can't trust them because <laughs> any moment they may give up. No. They are dependable. As a matter of fact, one of the words for, for faithful is a pillar. A pillar, something that is strong, the structure, the building depends on it. Are you that dependable? Can you be depended on? When you tell people you're going to deliver a job at 6 o'clock on Monday, do you deliver at 6 o'clock on Monday? We all don't measure up fully to that. But that should be what we are aiming at. Then when I say, depend on me, you can depend on me. You can trust me. We have to be dependable. Third, to be faithful, you must know your limits. And do not abuse opportunities given to you. The good thing for Joseph was that he knew his limits. 
And he said, he noted it in his statement. He says, I have everything here except you, madam. You are my limit. You are my boundary. Why? It's because you are the man's wife. Now David, uh, Joseph did not say, because you are, you are ugly. Or because I'm not attracted to you, or because I don't like you, or because I'm not flattered by your attention. He didn't say that. It's because you are his wife. In other words, you are his wife. Whether you are beautiful, you are nice, I like your food, I like conversing with you, you, you are my soulmate, whatever, doesn't matter. You are his wife. You are another man's property, so to speak. You belong to him. May we be able to say that. Say to that man, you are another woman's property. I like the fact that you have money and you can buy me lunch. I like the fact that you can buy me a car and who doesn't like a house? But you are not mine. Can you say that to that man who loves you? Who gives you attention? You are not mine. Can you say that to that woman? You are not mine. I like you, but you are not mine. I like your comments. I like conversing with you, but you are not mine. That's the simple statement Joseph was making. He had nothing to say about whether she was beautiful or not beautiful, appealing or not appealing, or whether the offer was even acceptable or not. It could have been acceptable to him. He was a nice young man. On a good day, I'm sure he would have accepted an offer. But, you are another man's property. If you are faithful in those matters, God will give you great things for yourself. If you are faithful to your spouse, you get a good marriage. A good marriage is based on faithfulness. You cannot love another man more than your husband and have a good marriage. You cannot love another woman more than your wife and have a good marriage. So far as there is a competitor in the marriage, it won't work. And don't come and say, my wife doesn't dress well, my wife doesn't, yeah, yeah, the way she cooks, and when she cooks and I drink the soup is like tea. And I don't know. Uh, <laughs> as I say to all married people when I counsel them, I, I tell them, that's what you got. That's what you got. There, were, there are three billion men in the world. You look around with your two eyes and that's what you got. There are three billion women. That's what you got. You don't like her cooking. Why didn't you go to catering school to recruit a wife? That's what you got. You liked her for something else apart from cooking. Now cooking has become a factor. But when you were courting her and said, See, Dad, I want to marry you, never considered cooking. <laughs> never. You considered something else. That thing which you considered, consider it still. <laughs> consider it still. Let me end with four scriptures on faithfulness. I'll just read them quickly. Ma Micah chapter 7 verse 2 to 3. This is what God says about Israel when he was commenting on the state of the nation. He says, the faithful man has perished from the earth and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The, bribe, the judge seeks a bribe. And the great man, great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. He says there's no faithfulness and he shows us how it manifests. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 45 to 47, Jesus says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, 
that he will make him ruler over many of his goods, over all his goods. A good and wise servant is the one who is given a responsibility and who discharges the responsibility. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 to 14. This is what Paul is saying. And I thank Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The part I like is that God has enabled me God has empowered me. Why? Because he counted me faithful. When God counts you faithful, he enables you. He empowers you. He gives you far more. Finally, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 20. A faithful man will abound with blessings. But he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A faithful man will abound with in blessings may god make all of us faithful may we be faithful in little things may we be faithful with money may we be faithful with other people's property and may god cause us to abound with prosperity may he give us true riches may he give us our own portion may he give us great things as we are faithful in little things, may he give us great things. As we are faithful with money, may he give us a true riches. As we are faithful with other people's property, may he give us our own property. Let's learn to be faithful. And God, the faithful God, will prosper and reward us. Amen. Well, my friends, I trust that God has spoken to you that you need to be faithful. Faithful in another man's work until God gives you your own. Faithful with money, that you can be trusted with money and that you'll be dependable. Because that's one area people fail miserably when it comes to money. Even great Christians fail. Well, I'm Pastor Mesa Otabel. Shalom, peace, and life to you. Thank you for making time to watch Living Word. To correspond with Dr. Mensa Otterville, please write to Living Word, International Central Gospel Church, P.O. Box 7933, Accra, Ghana. Call 021-688-000. Fax 021-688-007. Email otterville at centralgospel.com. And visit our website at www.centralgospel.com. 